Hello and welcome back to the Florida Orchestra. We're so delighted to be back with you after a long eight-month pause. I'm Ed Parsons, General Manager of the Florida Orchestra. Always a pleasure to have with us our Music Director, Michael Francis. Hello, welcome back. What an unusual time we're in, but where there's a will, there's a way, and the Florida Orchestra has a tremendous will, and we have some fantastic concerts ahead for you this season. In this age of COVID, these concerts will look a little differently. You can see that we have the musicians spaced out. They will be masked. We have robust testing protocols and lots of other things that we're doing to keep the musicians safe and to keep the audience safe as well. We have limited capacity, um, but we will be inviting people to come in and join us uh, live and in concert. And if you aren't able to join us, well, you are in luck because for the first time in the history of the orchestra, we will be live streaming our concerts and we're very excited about that. Yes, I think it's a real example of our flexibility in the face of this pandemic to continue to bring what is such an important art form to you. We know how much you love the orchestra, know how much you love music, and we're determined to make sure that you still have that uh, this season. And for our first concert back, um, as we talked about this program after such a long pause, um, you had this idea of, of a concert revolving around the idea of dance. Dance is the most ancient of social interactions. It is, of course, one of the key aspects of mating rituals in all societies, it is the way that we come together to celebrate, to commiserate, to reflect, to enunciate the various seasons in all villages, tribes, um, right back as far as we can possibly imagine. So it seemed to me an appropriate way to sort of remind us of the power of music, but also perhaps poignantly of what we can't do at the moment, which is dance together. So we thought it's a great way to start the program, and our first piece encapsulates this in a really interesting way. Right, it's by Jessie Montgomery, and she's one of the leading young composers working today. Her music has been and is being performed by major orchestras all over the world. For the last 10 years, she's been involved with the Sphinx organization, which supports young African-American and Latinx string players. Um, she first joined them as a violinist and now works with them as a composer, as their composer in residence for their flagship ensemble, the Sphinx Virtuosi. And her mi music mixes classical, music with, the el with elements of pop, improvisation, and social justice. The work we will perform tonight is her work Strum, and it's one of her biggest hits. It was composed in 2006 for her own string quartet, the Catalyst Quartet, um, and was arranged for string ensemble for the Strings Virtuosi in 2012. Yes, it's a wonderful piece, and you'll notice when you see the concert is actually um, how the strings begin. They're told to hold instruments like a guitar, and this pizzicato effect and the, um, really sets up this it almost feels a little bit evocative of B.B. King. I mean, this idea of there's a blues feeling to it. And then as this music, which is very nostalgic and evocative, moves into a tremendous climax towards the end of it. It's only about eight minutes long, um, but it says so much and is very virtuosic for the strings. Let's have a little listen to the beginning of it. I think you can tell already there's a wonderful sense of playfulness. There's a real American language within it. Um, as Ed mentioned, there's a Latin quality as well. Uh, and then she described it as a piece that has the kind of narrative that begins with um, a telling nostalgia and transforms into an ecstatic celebration. And the end of it is indeed joyous and very virtuosic. A wonderful way to start the season with a tremendously talented American composer. And our next piece uh, follows the dance theme. It's Zoltan Kodai's Dances of Galanta. And Kodai was a renowned Hungarian composer. In fact, another very famous Hungarian composer, Bela Bartok, once said that his works are the most perfect embodiment of the Hungarian spirit. Now, Galanta is a small village in the northern Hungarian countryside where Kodai grew up. And it takes its, the piece takes its themes from manuscripts Kodai found when studying Hungarian folk music, uh, and most specifically, gypsy tunes from the area in which he grew up, Galanta. Yeah, and Kodai, like Bartok, was fascinated in really capturing this, what seemed to be almost a dying tradition of the oral craft of passing on folk music from one generation to the other that had gone back centuries. They both went round and wrote down all this folk music. They recorded it, almost like somebody capturing butterflies of the past and keeping them for posterity so that we can see them and enjoy them today. It's, it's, they were kind of wanting to be a living museum of something that doesn't have 
a traditional manuscript part to it, because it was always passed from father to child and mother to child and continuously onwards. And this piece, um, as Ed mentioned, has a gypsy quality to it. And it's part of what was known as the Verbunkos style. And this was a recruitment. In fact, it was a recruitment for the army. And what they would do, they would go around with this gypsy band to these villages and Kadai witnesses many times, and they would play this fantastic music. They'd always choose the most handsome soldiers and beautiful dancers looking magnificent. And they'd go around to the crowd, putting little silver coins in the peasant boys' hands and saying, if you join the army, beautiful women will await you. Look at this dancing. Look how magnificent it is. War is so glamorous. It was the ultimate form of um, conscription in a very elegant way. But dance was the way that they achieved it. And that shows the power of music to incite us into whatever people want. Of course, political campaigns use music all the time. I'm thinking back to 1997 in the United Kingdom, and the Labour government then used a song by D. Ream called Things Can Only Get Better. And that had a very powerful effect on the country. And if you look in the, the book of Daniel in the Bible, the way they used music to, Nebuchadnezzar used it to make sure they worship the idols. We look at how Hitler used music as well to really incite, of course, a very dark vision of the world. Music has this power to incite us, to inspire us, to do these things. And this is, um, the Verbunkel style is about dance, it's about the passion of the Hungarian language, the spoken language. And as we listen to a bit of this at the beginning, you can feel this, this passionate nostalgia in the clarinet writing. So after hearing that clarinet wonderful beginning, we then go to what is the, the next theme, and this you can hear much more of the speech patterns, the way they speak, that idea of the Scotch snap, which is ba ba, as opposed to ba ba. And that is very, very Hungarian. You hear that in all sorts of music, Janacek, for example, Bartok, and Kadai. Let's listen to this. You feel the music starting to move towards the dance. They're gonna start slapping their heels and, and hoo ha at any point. just feel the tension building in the music as it starts to move towards a faster pace. Soon after this, the first thing we heard in the clarinets comes back now in full technicolor glory, a kaleidoscopic example of what you can do with a small sized orchestra and the power of this gypsy music now heard with divided strings and everybody um, absolutely passionately playing this wonderful music. feel it pouring out and of course these young peasant boys would have just been completely blown away hearing this music played and which on the gypsy instruments they had quite a large selection of them would have been the first orchestral colors that Kadai would have heard. Now the piece gets faster and we come to the final section which is the Frist section and this is um, really showing the tremendous virtuosity of the gypsy style of playing the violin and you can hear this now as the strings get faster and faster as the solitary soldier would have been showing off his tremendous moves and showing them why war is a great thing, come and do it, how safe it is. Of course we know otherwise. It's impossible not to whoop and holler and be drawn in by this brilliant and virtuosic gem of a piece. This encapsulates all the great charm of Hungarian music and the idea of dance, in this case, to incite people to want to go to war, which contrasts very well with the next piece we're about to hear. Indeed, and so uh, 
Another slight difference in our, how our programs will run is that they're going to run without intermission. Normally we'd have an intermission at this point, um, but we're going to run straight on to, uh, to keep our audience uh, safe and distanced. So, and the perk we'll go into is Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 7. And it was important for you to come back with a major piece of music like this, even with smaller string sections with distanced orchestra. Yes, yeah, so and we have to remember that when Beethoven had these pieces performed, they weren't always performed with the full-size symphony orchestra, often with very small forces. And if, if those who've been watching TFM online will know that we did a feature on Beethoven 7. And if you want to learn a little bit more about it, please go to TFO um, at, uh, Music at Home, um, which is on a part of our website. And you can see some uh, videos, a short inside the music on that. Um, Beethoven Symphony Number no. 7 is important because it is this joyous, it's the, one of the most beloved symphonies he wrote. But it's also Beethoven's year. I mean, this is 2020. This was the year in which the whole world was celebrating Beethoven's 250th anniversary. Poor Beethoven had it cut brutally short by COVID, although I don't think we have to worry about Beethoven not having enough performances over the years. He's probably <laughs> the most performed composer of all. But this piece, I think, in some ways, is also being a little misunderstood. Wagner used a, a phrase which is very well known. He called it the apotheosis of the dance. And that phrase, I think, has done it quite a disservice because it is absolutely about dance. You hear this, these great rhythms and all the way through. There's a tremendous sense of rhythmic energy and propulsion throughout. But at the same time, this piece, you need to understand um, for what it was written and uh, for which occasion. And it was written for fundraising concerts um, as a sort of charity benefit for concerts, for, sorry, for soldiers wounded at the Riesel Battle of um, Hanau, which was um, sort of a, a recent war, and there were so many people died in these wars, these battles between Austria and France. I mean, I think by the time it got to 1809, 1810, this was written in 1813, um, I think Austria had been invaded four times by Napoleon, so war was very, very common. In fact, Beethoven said he was always complaining about the, the guns and the drums and this, this battle scene. And for Beethoven, whose hearing was going, it meant he felt that within his very, very being. Interestingly, Salieri was the assistant conductor for this first concert. Those who've seen the film Amadeus will, of course, know that. I think it's rather tragically for Beethoven, it was, this piece was referred to as a companion piece to uh, Wellington's Victory, uh, which was a much lesser-known Beethoven piece of music. They thought this one was just to accompany that. Of course, now no one really plays this piece, Wellington's Victory, but this piece is played all the time. It's a piece of real epic scale. There's a, there's a real contrast between this industrial strength, this power, this almost military war machine idea going on with these opening scales and this beautiful individual melodies. Just listen to the very beginning when you feel this huge plinth, these architectural structural chords and this solitary oboe trying to find something littleless and beautiful amongst the riveted music. we have all these scales that happen and we find ourselves in a very unusual key and there is this 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 idea and of course industrialization was so strong in, in, at its beginning really around this period as well this idea of the individual will against the giant machine which is something that Beethoven dealt with a lot in his in his writings and in his music so the music then does something incredible and in, and in this very very long and slow introduction which has moments of huge great strength he whittles the music down to just a few bare notes, um, just to almost one note, an E natural, and then it seems to stop and nothing happens before we gradually pick up the pace and we find ourselves in the allegro, the far section, in which you recognize the dance rhythms. <laughs> This is our own recording from our last performance. So we're all on one note, and it just seems to distill 
It's the most unmusically strange writing. You can't quite believe this brilliant composer does it. Still one note. Still the same note. But we start to expand. Still the same note. And then the rhythm catches. Harmony comes in. And into the dance. And then it feels this joyous rhythm and this, this rhythm of bump a dump bump a dump bump a dump bump that carries on all the way through, sometimes called the Amsterdam Amsterdam rhythm, uh, really has a very, very repetitive but hypnotic quality. But as we listen to the middle section of this symphony, the development section, you can tell there's always darkness afoot. It is joyous, it is uplifting, but at the same time there's always something lurking, rather menacing, underneath. <laughs> After this, the small climax. There's a ferocity. And what you'll notice if you listen, particularly to the cellos and basses through this symphony, you'll hear an awful lot of this kind of low, dolom, dolom, very deep tessitura, very low down, growling and just threatening slightly all the way through it. At the end of this movement, you'll hear something which is extremely psychotic. Um, you'll hear the double basses and cellos on this repeated line, ma maniacally, or maniacally, I should say is the right word, just repeating it as everything else goes on, and they don't give up on this thing. It's, it's really insistent and very strange. Have a listen to this and, play, and pay particular attention to the double basses. Just keeps going. The rest of the orchestra tries to move away. They don't let go. They're still going. Feel this tension building. Still going. They haven't let go yet. Now there. And that's an important thing that Beethoven does better than anybody. He knows how to hold the tension, the harmonic tension where the notes are clashing, and then he releases at that moment, and you just feel your body go like this. He has a brilliant way of manipulating our goosebumps, our physical kinetic connection to the music in a most magnetic way. Then we come to the second movement, and this second movement was recently made famous by the film The King's Speech. It was, of course, um, the, what the, the, the music that was used to accompany at the very ending of the film, very, very powerfully. But in the most simple form of rhythm, I'm not sure you'll be able to hear it in this hall that well, but just a very long, short, short, long, short, short rhythm. He just allows this music to, to move like an exorable march towards some rather dim future. And uh, can, we'll just go to the, the second exit. This is around bar 75 when we have the first big climax. Listen to the cross rhythms. We have one, two, two, and underneath you'll hear bam, 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 bam. And this tension of twos against threes has a rather iron mechanical quality with this melody trying to sing out over the top. Strange trumpets, always clashing. And this movement then goes into an amazing fugato, which you feel each instrument trying to enter very formulaic, very hierarchical, not unlike a military regiment, and this idea of sort of building together in this way. It's music that the, the rhythm never stops. In the first movement, we've always got this bump, ba dum bump, ba dum In the second movement, this bum, 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 rhythm going all the way through. In fact, it's almost one of the most rhythmically monothematic pieces of music ever written until this point. In the third movement, this is a scherzo, the, you know, the Italian word for a joke, a very fast minuet in which you feel the music flicking along at tremendous pace. But what he does with it is very unusual. He takes you to extremely un strange places, which is a little disconcerting and, dare I say, discombobulating. And there's this bizarre key changes from F major down to A major, huge explosions of sound, and then very, very quiet music 
it is a joke, but it, it's sort of not quite a funny joke. It seems somehow something slightly else. <laughs> Then suddenly, and these dynamic changes, which are something Beethoven did better than anybody else, really grab you and threaten us at the same time. In the trio, this is a very beautiful, languid, limpid section of music. And But then listen to the second horn. You will hear anyone who's watched Jaws, and I did as a very, at a very impressionable age, will have that feeling of something lurking underneath, waiting to capture you. Here now, listen to this syncopation as it gets a little faster. And then we explode. And in the fourth movement, he continues with this idea of this, this very clear rhythm of yum da 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 consistent, incessant, never stopping. The very beginning of it has a wildness. In fact, this is an Irish melody that Beethoven found in a book of folk music, also further connecting it to the Kadai. But the music is just, it's insistent, it's joyous, it's very, very tiring to play. <laughs> It's at the end of this symphony where we see the connection back to the first movement, to the second, to the third. And it's at this section, if you want to watch this bit online, you can. I go into further detail about it. But how the basses descend down to this chromatic line while we're all trying to build up to a climax. And we feel like we're stuck in this vice between a rock and a hard place as the music slowly builds up the tension until you feel it can't, you can't cope anymore. The horns explode, but the basses still keep you dragged in the wrong place. A moment of amazing, amazing tension and climax at the end of this most brilliant of symphonies. Let's have a listen to this. Now the basses go down. And the winds try to go up in their chords. And the strings are still going crazy on that rhythm. You feel that tension. The winds start to build, going higher. The basses haven't let you go yet. Still there, dragging. And here's the climax. But the basses haven't stopped. Still going, still going. Still going. Still there. Wait for it. Now. And then we chase to the end and we shall save that for the live performance. I have to say, that's an incredible tempo. Yes. And only this orchestra with you conducting can have that level of that's excitement. True. That's true. Even that, on a recording. That was us recording it. It is <laughs> fast, isn't it? It's very exciting. Well, you're going to have to come and hear it again. Actually, more in the original forces that Beethoven would have been used to with the smaller orchestra. In no way is this a compromise. This is perhaps even a more authentic performance. This is the idea of dance, but dance to really understand ourselves, all the various facets of life. Wonderful music, inspiring, exciting, exhilarating, and above all, just live music. Come and hear this live music, not on a recording, not on Zoom, not on Spotify, real people playing instruments for you. Thank and you if you much. can join us in live, uh, we have concerts all weekend. 
October 31st, November 1st, uh, and if not, October 31st, 8 o'clock, go to floridaorchestra.org to find our live stream, and you'll be able to join us from your home. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.